Hi, I'm Doris Purchase, and welcome to Beyond the Frame, a podcast created just for you by Propeller Art Gallery, artists empowering artists in Toronto. Together, we'll take a deep dive into the hearts and minds of working visual artists today and their practice. In each episode, you will hear illuminating and intimate explorations of all things art, and you'll hear it in the artist's own voice. We'll talk process, inspiration, challenges, and much more. Everything you've ever wanted to know about art making or about the artists themselves happens right here. So let's sit back and have a listen, shall we? Today we welcome Moso. Which ism is it? Under which ism would you classify your work? Well, so this one came to a deeper thought for me. It more relates to the fact that I'm a photographer, and photography seems to be pigeonholed into separate categories like landscape, street photography, portraiture, bird photography, things of that nature. And I've indulged in, uh, in most of those and still enjoy some of those as far as my photography is concerned. So I don't like that pigeonholing, but I've thought about it in detail as to what makes my pictures different. And I've uh, related best to uh, hyperrealism. And that I know comes from more of the painting world and taking a picture that is probably a photograph and making it into a painted picture, but adding extra realism to it in the terms of intensity and lighting and contrast and things like that. But that's exactly what I do to my pictures before they're finished product. So I think I relate more to hyper-realism, but I come at it from the photographer's point of view as opposed to the painter's point of view, but end up with a, a very similar result. Who's your muse? Influencers, educators, mentors, who has greatly inspired you? Uh, in respect of muse, I think uh, the actual reality of a human being or an individual is there in terms of, for instance, Ansel Adams with landscape, but more lighting and shadows and things of that nature and use of Karsh for portraiture and once again, lighting and black and white. But I would rather defer to my muse not being so much a person or people as opposed to objects. And the what is? Magazines. And I've thought about it going back to my youth, and I used to go to the library almost weekly, and there was a section of the library that was a sitting area with a whole bank of magazines uh, next to it. And so I tended to gravitate towards the magazines that uh, opened up the rest of the world to me. But in reality, the thing that I think was most endearing to me was the photography. So magazines like National Geographic, and Life and Time, and believe it or not, car magazines, Road and Track and Car and Driver had some of the most delicious photography and some of the most photoreal uh, presentations of uh, a world that I wanted to see and a world that I wanted to experience. And so that I would say that my muse, and it's, it's kind of anachronistic in this day and age, my muse was mostly uh, magazines of, uh, of an age. Materials matter. What are your chosen favorite tools and preferred medium? In respect of materials, I think that I can easily be classified as old school. You know, I never got an opportunity when I entered university and went through almost 14 years of training for being a surgeon. I never got a chance to get an actual darkroom. And by the time I graduated and got back to my hobby, I ended up having a digital darkroom. And so for me, the material that matters to me the most is that I try to control my whole process now from photography right through digital processing and through printing with my own pigment printer. I end up gravitating towards the old school of, you know, paper or prints that uh, mimic traditional darkroom silver halide type of photo paper. So I've almost exclusively moved my way toward a paper called a Hanemule Photo Rag Barita. And Barita basically means that there's barium sulfate, which is a metal in the paper itself, which tends to replicate most closely old school silver halide prints. So 
to me, the material matters. To me, the material is exactly what I want to get out of it, and that is uh, replicating what was once most popular. Slump secrets. What methods do you employ to get yourself out of a slump? So in this question, with this answer, I can tell you that I am a very lucky guy. I'm still a practicing surgeon, so my days are full. And I look forward to my photo opportunities and my photo days. They tend to energize me. And so I tend to find that I haven't had any slumps and hope never to have slumps. The other aspect to it is if you look at my website, I like to think of photography as part of my life of discovery and that I'm still learning all the time and I'm still challenging myself all the time. So I've had no slump yet and I hope that the way that my brain thinks about my photography, I will not end up having a slump. In the beginning. So tell me a bit about your process. Do you have a bag of tricks, lucky talismans or habits? Where do you start? And more importantly, when do you stop? So in the beginning, it all starts with a journey and my camera. So whether it's a trip to a corner of the planet, my wife and I tend to travel a lot, at least until COVID began. We've been to all seven continents, and it always starts with grabbing my camera and going out to see the world and then documenting the world. The big thing for me is that I always like to walk a lot and interact with the locals and the local environment. And in fact, that's how I got to meet Sharon Forrest of Propeller and how I became a Propeller member. I actually was walking along Mount Pleasant uh, doing my COVID era photography and took pictures of Sharon doing a mural on a wall and, of course, engaged her in conversation. And from there, we went through can I see some of your work and have you been exhibited? And so to me, all of the openings that have been created for photography have always started with a journey and with my camera. Calling all emo. What do you wish people to think or feel when they contemplate your work? I only hope for one thing from those who view my art, connection. So to me, this is the the key to all of my art and to all of my photography is connecting with the viewer in whatever manner they feel is important to them. In my most recent self-published book on COVID Toronto, where I took four seasons of photographing different parts of Toronto, different communities, I really try to engage in people. But when I show people the book now, they either relate to it because they can tell where the picture was taken or they relate to it because they see the individual or the circumstance and can create their own story. So to me, I feel most successful when I have uh, connected somehow emotionally and otherwise uh, the uh, patient, sorry, the viewer patient, the viewer, (laughs) sorry, when I can connect the viewer with uh, with the picture itself. That was goofy, wasn't it? The struggle is real. Talk to me about your biggest challenges as an artist. What methods do you use to overcome these challenges? To me, the greatest challenge that I have with my photography is to create the more emotional and relatable image. You know, it's been great for me as I grow and I learn with my photography to bring more emotion into it. I started off more as a landscape photographer and pretty is pretty and You know, you can actually imagine where you are or how beautiful the place is, but I've uh, moved on mostly to uh, street photography and basically portrait photography, but not in a classic studio sense. And to me, to get the essence of the individual is the big challenge. I'm learning. I have moved on to mostly black and white photography and different types of depth of field to create an emotion that is very much more relatable for the viewer. Picture perfect. In your opinion, what constitutes a perfect piece of art? And what qualities in your own work would you signify as a perfect work? For example, perfect composition, confident brushstrokes, illustrating a concept, or something else altogether. Art, to me, is imperfect. And I find the, the details and the imperfections often define the most evocative pictures, which is what I'm aiming for. 
So as a background to this whole thing, yeah, I'm going to relate to the fact that I come from the surgical and scientific world. And I actually operate on human faces and uh, rearrange them to uh, be more perfect, as it were. And things like the golden ratio or golden proportion, which is uh, ubiquitous in nature and is something that we strive for, is uh, a guiding light for a lot of my surgery and probably has allowed me to have a better eye for my photography. But the truth is that if you practice for a long time, you start to realize that you're not actually aiming for perfection. Perfection shows you the direction that you want to go, but that customizing and making each individual uh, treatment plan and each individual photograph being its own imperfect self is actually the best answer to what humans relate to and what is most uh, emotive and evocative. So the answer to me is there is no perfect picture and the imperfection is the perfection itself. Art is not formulaic. Art Speak. How do you feel about titling, discussing, and explaining your work? You've now found my major weakness. I do not have a formal art education, so many times I'm unable to express myself in the formal language of art. And being an outsider listening to actual artists and uh, formally trained artists speak, there's almost a language that I thoroughly understand, but that does not come from, from my tongue or from my brain very easily. So I would say to you that I'm not very good at art speak and I'm learning. And I think that this is um, an area that I actually enjoy being a student of at this stage in my life. It's part of the reason why my persona, my artist persona, is using a different name than my actual surgeon's name. And one of the reasons that I'm trying to be a different person and an educated person in a different way. Heavy metal or classical? What do you listen to while you work? Or is silence your thing? My music? None. I do have love for music, but not while I'm in my dark room. So obviously it's a digital dark room, but I tend to find that I tend to put my face very close to my screen and I tend to very deeply immerse myself in the image that I'm working on at the moment. And to me, that basically deters me from listening to music or anything else that distracts me. I close the door to my little studio room and nobody bothers me. And I get to work intensively on the particular image I'm working on and I get distracted, none at all. So no music while I do my uh, darkroom work. Why for art thou? Why do you make art? My art? My art has always been for my viewer. And while I've always done it as a personal initiative and I've always enjoyed it for my own purposes, the truth is that it all started mostly with travel and carrying a camera and basically bringing home images of where I was. But the truth is that my first effort was always to create an album and to share it with friends and family. And that group has grown larger and larger as the trips and the years have gone by. And so to me, the big initiative is always wait till you get home and wait till you process these pictures and wait till you share this one and that one and the, the other one. So my art, as I say, has been about the viewer. I always want to uh, share where I've been and share what I've experienced. And it's a good memory for myself as well. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Frame, a PAG podcast. To hear more episodes and to view the artist's works, please visit www.propellerartgallery.ca. Hosted by Doris Purchase, produced by Tracy Thompson, and recorded at the Orange Lounge Studio in Toronto. Also, the Propeller Art Gallery recognizes the presence of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Huron-Wendat Nations. We acknowledge we are hosted on land governed by Treaty 13, the Toronto Purchase, the Two-Row Wampum Treaty, and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are committed to peaceably sharing and caring for the resources around the Great Lakes and operating the gallery 
on the principles of inclusiveness as we continue to exhibit art created by artists from all over the world. Thank you for listening.